Well, welcome back once again to Talking With Tech. My name is Lucas Stuber, joined as always by Rachel Madel. How are you? I'm doing really good. I'm sitting in a new office of mine. So really? I'm really, yeah, I'm really excited. I have been doing a lot of in, I do a lot of in-home and in-school consultations and do all stuff out in the community because I think it's really effective, but the driving in LA has been crazy. So I, I, I started uh, sharing an office space um, part-time. So I'm in my new office. Congratulations. That's, that's a huge step. I see a bunch of diplomas on the wall behind you. How much did you have to pay to counterfeit those? They're not mine. So it's, <laughs> it's so funny. I was just on a call with a, a new client, a video call, and they're like, wow, like, look at all these diplomas. So I was like, you know, I wish they were mine, but they're not. <laughs> There, there was a time that I loved displaying those, and I think they're under the bed now. Um, but yeah, they'll, they'll, dust. they'll come out again someday. And we are not joined by Chris Begay, who is taking a little bit of a vacation. And in the absence of our school SLP, uh, we actually want to do uh, it, it, a little episode here about entrepreneurship, right? And the, and the process of starting um, a private practice, particularly in light of the interview that we have today, which is uh, with Barbara Fernandez of Sp Smarty Ears, uh, who's a prolific entrepreneur, um, to say the least. And, and somebody I'm, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with her products. But just to kick it off, I mean, these, it's always interesting to hear pe how people ended up where they are. So Rachel, if you'll be our guinea pig, how, how did you decide to start a private practice and what was that like for you? So I'm from Philadelphia, which I think a lot of, a lot of our dear listeners know, but I was working, doing early intervention at a preschool and I started picking up part-time hours at a private practice and kind of dabbling in that. And then I started um, seeing clients privately. And I started just on nights and weekends after work, I would just see a few clients and I ended up meeting a very influential client. The little boy had autism and the family was, was really wonderful. And I, I just really connected with this little boy so much so that the mom was like, anytime you'll come, we'll see you anytime. And so I started seeing him pretty intensively and he was from uh, Los Angeles. So what happened was they were moving back and they had lived in Philly for about a year. I worked with him pretty intensively. And then when they were moving back, they did not want to go. Mom, I, I'll never forget mom crying in the hallway with me saying like, I don't know if we should leave. He's doing so well. And so instead of putting him in summer camp, they asked if they could fly me out to LA. And so I was like, of course you can fly me out to LA. I felt so important. You know, what and kind of clients do you have? What, my I, gosh, this, Hawaii, geez. I, I know, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, so anyway, I came out to LA and I loved it here. And they were selling me hard on the practice. They're like, you're such a great speech therapist. You could start a private practice here. We know so many families, so many clients you could have. And I was sold. Honestly, I went back, I sold all my stuff. And about a month later, I moved here um, to LA. And I started a practice and it was the scariest, craziest thing. And it was not easy by any means. Um, of course, none of the clients they recommended and referred to me ended up becoming clients of mine. Um, so I was straight hustling for a solid year when I first moved out here um, just to, to build a network. Um, as you know, Lucas, being in private practice, it's all about who you know. Um, it's all about that network to get referrals from. And you, you never take for granted your network more than when you leave it. So I had a ton of, you know, psychologists and OTs and all these people in Philly. And then I moved to LA and I mean, I knew, I knew one family. And so it was just kind of like starting from square, square one and building up. Um, but I've been out here for, it'll be four years in September. Um, so everything, everything's good, but that's how, that's how I started the practice. And I just, I, it's crazy that I flew across the country with two suitcases and like started a business. Um, I, I always knew that if I didn't try, if I didn't take that opportunity, I would always wonder, well, what would have happened if I, you know, went to LA and tried to, to start practice? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, that's great. I, I actually, that's funny that I've, I've never asked you that question before, but I didn't know that story. That's, uh, that's really inspiring to uproot for a, for a specific client and then, um, you know, be so successful in the, you know, relatively short term. I mean, four years is not a huge amount of time in the world of small business. Um, but I also do like the comment that you made about having to hustle for a year because I also don't want people 
people listening to think like, oh, it's this magic portal to money and fame. And it's really not, let me tell you, it is a lot of work. Um, but I, I, I guess I have a sort of a similar story minus the relocation. Um, you know, I was uh, a, a school SLP initially, which is funny because when I um, went to grad school, I actually was thinking I was going to be an aphasia guy. That was um, that was sort of my interest area, and like many people that I know, of course, that changed once you get to know um, you know the different populations, and I it works out perfectly because I'm essentially a six year old uh, myself, so uh, you know I get to just be myself all day. Um, but I, you know, one thing that happened to me that I think happens to a lot of people is that when you graduate, right, you start out as very much a generalist, like you, you know, um, you know, a basic amount of information about a, a wide variety of topics relevant to SLP. And I um, just happened to fall into a, a, a clinical fellowship um, where I was, you know, put in a position where I had a lot of AAC clients. And um, which was great because I and I and I sought that out. I mean, I, I had already really known that I was going to be into AAC, um, but that was it, it. It became a real thing for me. And there was one client in particular, as a young girl with Rett syndrome, that um, watching the sort of transformation for her uh, when she sort of first received a, a, a functional communication device, and she really hadn't had one, you know, for for seventeen years. Um, that was such a transformative experience for me that I was just like, that's it. This is what I'm going to do. Um, and in doing so, sort of became a specialist, right? And, and, and the reason why I, I make that distinction is because I think that that shift actually played a huge role in, in leading me into private practice, right? Like, I think it would have been harder for me to just put up a shingle, so to speak, as like Lucas, the general SLP. But when you have a specific subcategory of population or a niche or a intervention that you really focus on, that allows you to be a lot more targeted with, you know, the populations that you're advertising to and like what sort of events you go to and, you know, the social media groups and everything else. Um, so, I, I mean, that was really a launch pad. Yeah, so I I think you hit the nail on the head. Like having a specific niche is really great, and it's not. And we know it's not just great for SLPs; it's great for all business. Uh, there's a really amazing article called "A Thousand True Fans," and it talks about the importance of you know really getting specific about your business vision. Um, you know, when we start a business, we, we kind of think intuitively. Yeah, of course, we want everybody to benefit. Like the more people, the more money. Uh, but what's what's interesting is if you think about it, um, if you have something very specific that you do, um, you know, people who have those very specific needs want to want to get information from you um, because they can't get it anywhere else. Um, so really having a specialty is, is what I think has definitely propelled my private practice. Um, you know, there's a lot of competition in LA. Everybody has a private therapist. Every single person gets school therapy, but every single kid gets private therapy too. So it's not like that in other parts of the country. It's definitely not like that where I'm from in Philly. Um, so, you know, to be a generalist pr in private practice out here is really tough. Um, I, and so I think having the specialty of AAC and then specifically autism uh, has really helped me because... It, in some ways, it kind of limits my, my practice, right? Because I feel like I'm only getting like the same referral, you know, autism and AAC, um, which has its own kind of its own bag of issues. But it's really interesting that now I'm getting so many referrals because there's not a lot of people who specialize in AAC in Los Angeles. And there's not a lot of people who do specific work with kids with autism. Um, so I do think having a specialty is really important yeah. and valuable. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's just it's a good way to sort of distinguish yourself in the crowd, right? And in fact, I, one thing that was kind of funny that would start to happen to me is I would get phone calls, you know, looking for intervention for like articulation, right? For you know, an elementary school student, and, and I would sort of answer the phone and be like, you know, I just had to take off my Kevlar sleeves to come out into the waiting room here. Like, what are what are you talking about with this R problem, you know? And um, yeah. which implies to me that there absolutely is you know, a, a place for, for those articulation specialists or whatever it might be. But, you know, that's just not where I landed. So, um, so, but I, but I think that was, um, I, you know, I'm just enormously grateful for that having happened. Now I do want to come back to the, it being a hustle thing, right? Because what, what, what sort of happened to me is I was working in the schools and, um, suddenly picked up a couple clients on the side as a result of uh, networking with local organizations, right? So I started volunteering for a couple of 
nonprofits. I ended up on the board of an autism society chapter and started to connect with people that way, which was a, a huge side piece, um, you know, as well as starting to engage in like local social media groups and things like that, which was probably the other big driver for me. And um, all of a sudden was like inundated, right? So I, you know, then all the, then I, I'm working in the schools and I've suddenly got like 20 families that are interested. And I took the leap and I said like this, you know, this is it. I'm going to go start my own practice. And I uh, rented an office space and, and did all that stuff. And then, and then immediately found a bunch of places that I'd gone wrong. Like the first one is that of, you know, of 10 people that contact you and say, yes, I want your services long term, I would say probably two are going to stick around. Right. And, and, you know, certainly there's, I can, I can put plenty of blame at myself. Right. I mean, you know, if you're a perfect clinician, maybe that number is different, but I think realistically that's, that's probably the expectation is like a fifth. So don't count your chickens. Right. And then number two is that in, in having made that leap and gotten office space, I had, I had extended myself in terms of a financial commitment, right. For this office. And then immediately discovered that for reasons of mobility and, and convenience that what people wanted really was in home services, right? And particularly because, you know, in AAC, contextual stuff like working in home can be so valuable. So I, I, it was funny because I sort of ended up with this big, beautiful office with all my diplomas on the wall and uh, was there maybe a quarter of the time. Um, so I wish that I would have taken the route, I guess, Rachel, that you said you did of doing the in-home stuff and then sharing a space rather than jumping right in. Because I had that same year-long hustle. I just had a big bill the whole time. Yeah, and that's one of the, the wonderful things about starting this kind of business is that it's essentially risk-free in a lot of ways. You know, you can have a full-time job and start picking up private clients. Um, there, there gets to a tipping point, right, where it's like, okay, I either need to, like, totally dedicate myself to this practice or, you know, be working way too many hours in a week. Um, so it, it does get to a tipping point, but you know, doing in-home therapy, there's not a lot of overhead. Um, you know, so it's just, you don't have that big office bill. And that was something that was really appealing to me, especially in the beginning, because I didn't know if this business was going to be successful at any given moment. I was ready to just hop on a plane and go live on my parents' couch because I'd blown through my savings. Um, <laughs> I, and, and so much so that I didn't sign a lease when I got here. I, I did Airbnb and I did sublets for a while. I rented a car. Um, you know, I was kind of like a vagabond for my first like six months for sure. But even the first year, um, it was really, it was hard. And I didn't know whether it was going to, if it was going to work or not. And so I think that, you know, kind of speaking to, to your, your talk about the hustle, um, you know, I, I was trying real hard to make connections real fast. And at the end of the day, a lot of people have asked me, you know, how has your practice become so successful and what has made it work? And I really think it comes down to one thing, doing good work. And if right. you do good work, clients will come eventually. Um, you know, word of mouth referrals are the most powerful source. Um, if you have somebody that will speak, you know, amazing words about you and, and, and sing your praises, then you will get clients. And, yep. and, and that's what it comes down to. And, and I talked about this in, you know, maybe last week's episode or an episode before this, but it's really about just going a little bit, a little bit above and beyond, um, especially in private practice, because you know, you, you can't, at some level, you have to kind of go above and beyond because parents are like, I'm paying extra money for this. This is, you know, my time, you know, outside of work that I'm taking my kid to come see you. Um, so it does feel like the stakes are a lot higher. The other thing I really love about private practice is it's individualized. So when I was working in the preschools, I was doing a lot of group therapy. And a lot of times it was, you know, four or five kids and they had all different types of goals. And it just felt like so hard to manage and be effective at the same time. So it's really nice to be able to, you know, really focus on one child and, and really dive deep and figure out what's going on with them and how I can really help them learn how to communicate better. Yep. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, you made a comment a little bit ago too about um, when you, when you only have that one client, right. That you're able to like dedicate all your time to them. And, and that can be, I remember being in that situation where I, you know, I got this big office and I ended up only having four or five consistent clients in the beginning, but you know what, in those moments, you just got to make sure that that, you know, that kid is the only kid in the world, right. That that is your sole focus. And you just go so far above and beyond because like you said, the, the word of mouth piece is, is enormous, right. I mean, there's uh, you know, positive 
word of mouth goes goes a, a, a huge way, but negative word of mouth goes like 500 miles. You know, there's actually a, a joke in um, the area I just moved from that there's there's an autism moms Facebook group that is, and it is like closed. Like if you are not an autism mom, you are not allowed. You are there are no dads, no siblings. It is autism moms, and I oh, like yeah. I, I've been told by those families that like if you get the kiss of death in there, that is the end, right? You know, so exactly. Uh, any any one of those people and and of course it's not like any one of us would would deliver inferior service to someone because they're not in that group you know but it's just important to remember that i mean you're you're why if, you, if you're if you're working in the schools you're going to have the same caseload next year whether or not you're giving equal attention to every student but if you get that one bad review in private practice that can have repercussions for years um, no absolutely those those mom networks they are like so powerful. So you get in with the mom network in a positive way and you have more business than you can, you know, even take. Um, but yeah, if, if something goes wrong, it's, it's not, it's not good. It's yeah. like, it's literally a kiss of death. <laughs> moms, moms rule the world. It's the truth. No, and, and, and two, I want to emphasize, like, you know, you made this interesting comment. It's a sentiment I've heard a lot of like this perception that somehow the private practice services are like superior in, in some way. Right. And like, I just want to be clear that, that if those of you listening, that's not what either one of us mean. Right. Right? Like it, there, I, we, ha, I have encountered that from families and it's something that I like, try to correct, you know, um, because the level of services in the schools really shouldn't be any different. You know, um, the difference is that some kids maybe have a higher level of need, right. That would warrant additional services that are covered by insurance. And, you know, and then the reality is that some families socioeconomically can afford additional services. And that's, that's, those situations are a bummer. You know, when I started my private practice, I had this real explicit mission of serving the lower. SES populations, right? Like I wanted to take every Medicare, every Medicaid and all those things. And um, that's another piece of forewarning to send folks is that that is hard. Insurance billing to begin with is hard, but when you're looking at Medicare or Medicaid where you maybe only get $27 back for an hour of service or something like that, that's, you really can't, you can't pay rent on that, you know, um, mm -hmm. when it comes to, to having your own place. And that's something that you need to take into consideration for your own uh, purposes, but, um, but also later on down the road. So like in my near right like I had that year of, of scrambling and then there was sort of a second little boom and um, I ended up with a, with a big practice so I had a, a number of other SLPs working for me and SLPAs and we even had a BCBA at one point and three locations and all this different stuff and it was great and fun but then I ended up where I was in a situation where I was doing nothing but insurance billing and paperwork all day and supporting the other SLPs and lo and behold I got rid of my practice and sold it pretty quick after that uh, because it stopped being fun right so I mean as much as I as much as it's wonderful and we you know we're, we're talking about sort of how to get into it you also need to keep in mind like what your priorities are in life right and for me it's delivering the intervention um you know it's not sitting behind a desk I couldn't agree more. And that's why I have a few therapists that work for me part time. But it was never my goal to have this huge practice, um, you know, with lots of therapists, because I feel like when that happens is exactly like you said, Lucas, it shifts the focus. Um, I like practicing. That's why I became a speech therapist. I love doing therapy. And, um, you know, the more clinicians I hire, and the bigger office space that I get, you know, the less it becomes about the therapy and the more it becomes about you know, having to, to do more of the business upkeep and, and, and pay those expensive bills and, and things like that. So it's, it's always been important to me to not have a huge practice. Um, I, I love working privately because I, I'm just the kind of person that loves being able to make my own schedule. So I, I've always been like that. It's always been something that I think is one of the most important things about work is that I decide when I do it. Um, I work really hard. So it's not like if, you know, some people are like, I couldn't have a practice because I would never work. I'd be at the beach all day. Um, and that's just not my personality. And like, I, I will always work and I will always work hard. So it's more about, you know, being able to decide when I do things and if I want to take on a new client or not. And I felt like that was a challenge when I was working, you know, in, in the schools is that, you know, I didn't get a say. It was like, take this kid, you're at this location, like you have to see him, um, which is something else that's really nice is that like, sometimes it doesn't always click with a client. Sometimes like the family wants something different than like you, your, you know, theoretical background supports or, you know, so it's just, it's nice to have the freedom to say like, you know, this isn't a good fit or I don't have room in my schedule or whatever it might be.
Right. Absolutely. And that's a totally okay thing to do too. I don't want people to think, you know, it's like a refusing service sorts of things. There, there were situations, you know, I, a specific example that I have in mind is, um, is in the area of dysphagia, right? Where I would have people who were AAC clients that would have comorbid feeding and swallowing stuff. And I just was very upfront with people about not feeling competent enough in that area to be the specialist. And so I would work with someone else and that's okay. I mean, that's, that's, it's much more ethical to, to do that than to sort of try to fake it. I guess. Um, so, th I mean, this is th this is a huge topic, and we're going to talk a little bit more here now. We would actually like at some point to do um, a whole episode about sort of the nitty gritty about getting a private practice started. Um, and uh, if it's something you'd be interested in, uh, please let us know. Um, we're also uh, w moving towards starting um, some direct consulting stuff where we'd be working with SLPs and also potentially with school districts. And if that's something that you'd be interested in, let us know about that too, because we'd be curious. But let's look a a a at least a little bit into some of the things that everyone one should be doing now. So if you if you don't have a private practice and you're not even sure if you'd ever want to, there are still some things that you should take steps for. And some of them are just boring bureaucracy, but like everyone knows about licensure for ASHA and for state stuff, right? But there's this other number, right? An NPI or a national provider identification number. And it's free to get. You should just go online and register for one because if you don't have one when you need to start um, getting credentialed with insurance companies, you might be sitting around waiting for a few months. Another big thing that I think I see a lot of clinicians struggle with is a website. And I think that, you know, I think a digital presence in 2018 is essential to any business. Um, but I think it depends. If you just want to pick up some clients on the side, I don't think it's necessary. But if you want to scale your business and make it full time, then it's absolutely essential. And you don't have to spend, you know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of dollars on having somebody do a website for you. Things like Squarespace, which is what my current website is hosted on, um, it's really user friendly. And I mean, I made my website by myself. Everything on my website, I've done. Um, you know, I'm am SLP. I'm not like I don't know HTML coding and all these things. Uh, but I just it is a testament to how relatively easy it is. Especially if you're listening to this, you're probably doing AAC work, which means you're already, you know tech savvy. So it's really pretty straightforward. But I think it's really important that people are able to find you online. Um, and going along with the website, also a Yelp page. When I started a Yelp page for my business, which I didn't start until like two years ago. So I was like two years into my practice, I started a Yelp, I had a Yelp page. It, people are like finding me all the time through Yelp. So especially if you're in a place where there's not a lot of competition, it's so important to have a Yelp page. And then even better, if you can get people to review um, and put reviews on there, because then you'll, you'll, people will be able to find you and then, of course, read wonderful things about you. I hear a lot of SLPs say things like, uh, you know, that they feel like it's silly to, to have a website for themselves or that they're, you know, they don't really participate in social media and those sorts of things. And you know what? I totally get it. Like, it's, in fact, like, I think we joked about this recently, but like Facebook has become like work for me straight up. Like it is, it is like a job to, to go on there and respond to everything. But here's the thing about that is that either you control your online identity, right? Or it will be controlled by someone else. Like there will be a narrative about you as a clinician, period. Like it's going to happen. And that's that's true in a lot of fields, right? So get out there and 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 just and take control of it. And the way that you do that is is Yelp. It's by having a website. Squarespace is great. I totally agree with you. I mean it's like you can do like 15 bucks a year. And even if you're just putting your name and a picture and you know your graduation date up there, like just just have it, right? And then that way you also own own the domain name that's associated with your name. Um, you know, some other big ones are just like even if you don't do anything with it, having a Facebook page for yourself or for your business. Um, once you reserve that in Facebook, then you have that URL forever and it can just sit there if you ever want it. Um, same thing with health grades. Um, once you register for an NPI, websites like health grades will automatically create an identity for you in their system, whether or not you participate. Like if you have an NPI, you, you can be found on health grades. And so what you need to do is go to health grades and there's a, there's a way that you can claim your profile where you provide identification and then you have the ability to log in and, and, you know, add additional information. And, um, that's, that's actually a pretty important one that I didn't realize until late in the game. And I already had a ton of reviews on there. Um, so, uh, it was, it was good to, to, to check that. Um, Lucas, I didn't even know about health grades. 
so like oh. you just taught me something. Yes. <laughs> I'm nervous. I have to go on now. I hope I have good reviews. Everybody go give Rachel a review on healthcare. It's 10, 10 stars. I don't even know if Arcos. Well, and, and, you know, I think a lot of them are regional too. Like, so in my area, Yelp was never a thing. Like I, I invested a bunch of energy into it and it never works, but in LA, maybe it is, you know, but in certain other places, you know, uh, other things to do are, you know, when you are ready to, to start, you know, actually seeing clients, you know, or, or looking for them, contacting folks like the local, the local autism societies and whatever, and getting your name on their registries also, which they will have on their websites often. Um, you know, that can be a, a really effective thing to do. Um, going out to, uh, you know, to events, like there will often be little like, like kid fest is one in my area where uh, you can get a table for like a hundred bucks and just, you know, play with kids all day, talk about what you're doing. And even if it's an event for neurotypical kids, you will very often encounter, you know, kids who could benefit from our services among that group. Before we get into the interview with Barbara Fernandez, I just wanted to touch on this idea of fear holding you back because, you know, it, it, we, we're making it sound so easy. We're just like, oh yeah, we started our practice and it's great. There was so much fear for me. And, you know, moving to a new city is hard enough. And then having to start a business when I'd never started a business before, it was really scary. And I think we all go through these moments of imposter syndrome, where we feel like, you know, we're not good enough or smart enough or all of these things. We're not enough to be in private practice. We don't have enough skills or knowledge. And that's a normal process. And if I were to listen to that voice inside of my head, I would have never had the courage to start a practice um, and to do you know, all of the things that I've done with my career. So I just encourage our, all of our listeners who are thinking about potentially starting a practice, you can do this. You have the expertise, you have the knowledge, you just have to you know, put it into action and silence that voice inside of your head that's telling you that you might not be able to do it realize that that's normal. Uh, we all go through that no matter, you know, what we're doing in our careers, but just do it and just get out there. And, and, you know, if it's not working, you can pivot and you can try something different. Um, but I think that, you know, a lot of times we, we let our fears stop us before we even get started. And I'm so happy that I had an encouraging family and friends that, you know, every time I had those doubts, they were like, no, Rachel, you're great. You're going to be awesome. Um, because I definitely in the beginning needed those pep talks. Yep, absolutely. I mean, that's you know, it's you can walk any distance, right? With with a series of single steps, and um, that's that's what it feels like, especially at the beginning. And you're gonna feel beaten up sometimes. I mean, there, I was in a car accident once when I was heading to one of my favorite clients, and I wasn't able to see him for weeks. And the family was telling me he was crying about this, and like it, it, it broke my heart to hear about that, you know. But like life interferes sometimes, and you know, you just need to pick yourself back up. You just gotta keep facing forward. And and if you if you want this stuff badly enough. Uh, it'll it'll absolutely work out. I mean, it's there's there is there is no poverty of children in need. Um, if it ever feels like there's too many SLPs in your area, I would argue that's probably not the truth. There is an under identification of kids that need services. Um, so uh, I don't know. I guess keep reaching out and um, and then there's the whole other extension past that, getting into consulting and creating AAC and all that, which you know maybe we can uh, sort of get into that in in a future episode. But that ties well into Barbara, right? who is an SLP who um, just bootstrapped the heck out of 800 different things and has more projects than, than I can keep track of, which is saying something because I normally have a lot of projects. Um, so I'm very impressed by, by her industriousness. Um, Rachel, I'm always impressed uh, by yours. Um, and we'd love to, to field any questions about this, and um, you know, I'm sure we'll revisit in the future. But for now, uh, without any, any more, let's, uh, let's listen to Barbara Fernandez. Well, welcome back once again to Talking With Tech. This is Lucas Stuber, joined as always by Rachel Madel. How are you? I'm doing good. And today, I'm super excited actually to be speaking with Barbara Fernandez. How are you? I am doing awesome. Also super excited. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, what do you do? What brought you to, to where you are today? So I'm also a speech language pathologist, have been in kind of focusing my energy in improving lives using technology for about... 10 years or so. Um, I was born in Brazil, and that's where I grew up. So I was there for 21 years of my life, um, and I didn't speak any English. So then one day I'm walking down the hallway, I see this nice note on my university. I was in and going to college for, for speech therapy. 
um, and he said, uh, an exchange student program to spend six months in the, at Temple University in Philadelphia in the United States. And I said, you know what, maybe I'll apply for this. So it turned out that it was an AAC program where I would do an internship at the Assistive Technology Institute in Philadelphia for six months, learn assistive technology, and then bring it back to Brazil. Wow. Where we're yeah. still using just paper-based stuff. I remember in college just cutting stuff out of magazine because we didn't even have access to a symbol set at the time. And long story short, short you know, hundreds of applicants that picked out two uh, SLP major students and two special ed uh, major students to come spend six months and that was uh 14 years ago so that six months got prolonged significantly and i'm very fortunate that i have been able to pay back that exact contribution to my life that i was offered as a student back then I, I feel like there's a lot of like Pennsylvania connections in my life right now, right, Rachel? What's going on here? Listen, I went to Temple. There's so many great AAC people who went to Temple. It's really wild. And as soon as you said Temple, I was like, oh, that's where I went. The way that I think I, I first uh, knew of you years ago was through the Geek SLP website. Was that, I mean, was that a, self, a self-styled nickname that, that sort of occurred? Or? In that between me seeing that post in college 14 years ago and today, I uh, founded two businesses. So I have Smarty Ears that I started um, in 2009. Then that Smarty Ears creates, have been creating apps. So I collaborate. I have my own apps that I develop on my own uh, where I'm creating content, planning for the app. And then I also collaborate with other SLPs in their own area of expertise. So for example, Smarty Ears has an app called Ice Screen Aphasia. And beyond uh, the scope of what I believe my expertise is. So I invited Tiffany Wallace that is an expert in aphasia and we worked on that project together to make that app out. In the beginning, as I was, you know, I've been making apps before the iPad existed. So I've been making apps originally for iPhones. I felt I was trying to convince SLPs. And this is the thing that when you're the first doing something, you're always going to struggle uh, that they could use their iPhone for therapy. You know, think back 2009, 2010, the iPhone was like the biggest, nicest, shiniest toy you owned. If you owned an iPhone back in 2009, oh man, this touch screen, this is just mind blowing. People were not ready to let their kids touch that device. I remember having my first booth and they're like, I don't think so. What if they drop it? They were not ready. So that's how Geek SLP was born is it was my attempt to give SLPs my vision of what the technology could do for our profession when they weren't seeing it quite yet. Um, so beyond my apps that I was creating. So um, I was doing video podcasts on you know, using the accessibility features on the iPad or what do you do when you have no sound and just these various tricks that are involved into actually using the technology that goes beyond me as a app developer. I felt that there was nobody building this bridge of the prerequisite knowledge that the SLPs needed to actually use the device effectively. So if you're, for example, in a group session, they don't have to stick to one app. Everybody has to work on this one app. I was teaching them how to multitask and use multiple apps in the background and make the students take turn, use hand gestures to switch between the apps and organize a therapy session around the device. So that's how that is still today. The primary purpose of Geek SLP as a blogger is I go around the country and actually present in Europe and Canada and Brazil. My goal is to bridge this gap between the products that I'm creating, as people see, um, as just a product out there in the marketplace versus this huge need that we have to become proficient in the technology we're going to be using for our students. Yeah, that's wonderful. And you have so many apps. It's wild. I like was on your site looking through all of them. And like you said, it runs the gamut from, you know, stuff with young kids to aphasia. Uh, it's really cool. So I'm wondering if you could tell us, what do you think makes a great app good for communication? Wow, that's a good question. Mm, now I'm thinking about that too. You know, when I started doing this, it was pretty lonely as being an SLP developer. I was surrounded by parents of kids with special needs who were creating these products. So it was very interesting early on 
there were these various parents that are software developers creating resources for the community. Materials weren't necessarily being created by someone that actually has uh, the knowledge or educated enough to make decisions on which features, on, you know, talk about evidence-based practice and things like this to actually create a product that it's tapping into what we already know to benefit in an effective way, right? You're just thinking you used to have a father that her daughter's um, best way of communication was with this set of images and that's what he was proposing to the market. Regardless, you know, he didn't know anything about motor planning and any of this information that professionals usually do. You know, being in it for 10 years, you know, I've, I've seen the shift where not only SLP started creating their products, but bigger companies that actually have tons of resource started creating these various apps, right? And because this is a broad question, you, you know, can talk about apps for AAC or apps for articulation or apps for language or aphasia. They, to me, one of the key aspects, regardless of who is designing it, be the parent that is a software designer or a therapist, that they actually gather the necessary features and information that could most likely benefit the majority of the users, right? This, of course, makes, would ultimately, you know, thinking of, uh, you know, in a business sense, would make your app more marketable because you're reaching a broader uh, group of people but um, also allowing the flexibility so that um, we are all different human beings, even though there are X, Y, and Z styles of actually creating a product that everybody would like the most. One thing that I've learned creating my own apps is allowing for that level of differentiation of use of the app. 90% of the apps I make is designed for an adult to be with a child. And so it's an adult-led use of the iPad 90 to 95% of the time. So I'm not designing apps where we're going to sit a kid in a chair and then let them go. And, you know, they could certainly do this, but that was not the primary intent of what I'm creating. Um, basically, because I believe the adults should always um, be co-viewing and participating as much as possible, especially when we're talking about apps. They're designed to help a student that is struggling in a particular area you need to have an adult leading that conversation or leading that interaction with the device. So going back to the question, it's a very complex because it's super open and there's various uh, types of apps that we'll be talking about here, but summarizing would be definitely looking back at what research has shown. And I use research in a very broad sense there to be most beneficial to the ultimate user, but allowing flexibility so that it can be customized to to the child that is using that ultimately is going to be using it. Well, and this that goes all the way back to one of the the first things you said about Geek SLP, which is a big part of the reason why we do this podcast too. To go back to our why, right, is the the fact that there are so many SLPs that are still really intimidated by technology, right? And um, an argument that I have often made to them is that you know you're also intimidated the first time you administer a self with paper or whatever it might be. Um, and if you view these, uh, you know, or as you are positioning them as really ultimately a piece of mediated curriculum like any other, then it, you know maybe it's not so much more intimidating. You know, I still have to read the rules to Candyland sometimes. You know, we get, I get in heated arguments about, do you, you, know, do you go all the way down that slide or if it stops in one square, you get out? Like, I mean, come on, this is complicated stuff, you know? Um, anyway, in many ways, I think one of the strengths of apps is that, uh, the, you know, it sort of takes care of a lot of that behind the scenes, right? In terms of the, you know, their, their inherently sort of rule bound structure and these other things. Um, and then another topic that I, th I think we sort of hit, hit upon was, I guess what I would call universal design, right? And it, which is part of the distinction between what makes an app good generally and what makes an app good for SLP. I, I think there's overlap between those those two things, right? And I think that's one thing that, um, right. like when you, you spoke to people that maybe sort of push into the technology industry from the SLP, SLP space, they don't always know about those things. You know, they don't do as good of a job of, of just working with a multi-touch device from a development standpoint. But then from the other side, you get these people that are maybe great at UX design, but know nothing about the science, right? Um, right. So, you know, you've managed to, to hit those, uh, you know, the sort of spot that nobody else can occupy between those two things. And you also have your own sort of uh, design standards and principles anyway. I mean, I, I you know, the art uh, is, is actually really pretty consistent with all the apps. I really like the style. Oh, good. Thank you. 
I also like ducks a lot, so that works out really well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you really hit the nail on the head as far as apps being adult-led, um, because one of the things that I find really interesting, you know, speaking to Lucas's universal design, is that if you talk to some people, you know, they think a good app for a child is one that you put in, you know, in front of the child and they're able to do on their own. Um, and, you know, I would argue from all the things that we're learning about screen time and language development that you know, it really is important to be co-viewing, you know, using a tablet. If we really want to increase communication, um, you know, I don't think the answer is just sitting a child in front of an app um, and just walking away. I think, you know, we can utilize technology and make it interactive and make it communicative and conversational um, because we know kids are really motivated by technology and by apps and, you know, harnessing that motivation. Um, and that's something that I often tell to parents who are, you know, there's a lot, I'm, I'm in LA, there's a lot of parents who are like, no screens, absolutely not. You know, and what I say to them is it doesn't have to be, you know, you're, you sit your child in front of a, a video and walk away. You know, it's a really great opportunity for conversation. Conversation. Um, and I think that's the, the big difference that I feel like not all app companies make, but I'm happy to hear that you say, um, you know, co-viewing is something that you find really important. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that we started this, you know, topic. It's for me, I've been doing this before I had children and this debate over kids on a screen have existed before I had children. My oldest has, is four years old. In 1982, I wasn't allowed to watch cartoons for sure. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And what I've been seeing, and I do find this somewhat unfortunate, what I've seen is the problem number one is I feel like there's a huge disconnect between the reality of being a parent, of parenting a child, and what is the highest standard that we put on these parents. So it's either you're letting your child watch TV or all day, or I won't let my child touch a screen. You know, I think of my own personal life. It's extreme chaos every day. I'm surrounded by technology. I create apps. There's no way that I, at a given time, there will be two or three iPads everywhere in my office, in my house. Um, my, that's how my child was raised around iPads. If you stop to think for a moment, you know, people say, um, no, no, no devices for kids, right? If a child is sitting, let's say, having lunch, so you put a child in a high chair and you give them their food, and you go away to clean the bedroom, clean the bathroom, whatever it is. That child is alone in a high chair eating with no communication because there's no adult near them, right? Right, good point. So option here is maybe for those 15, 20 minutes, they will be on an educational app, learning the numbers or learning the colors or whatever it is, or they're going to be alone sitting on the high chair, right? Sometimes we struggle having real everyday conversations with these parents and we're putting them to such a high standard of what typical life is for parents um, that it makes meeting people in the middle sometimes challenging, right? You hear SLPs in discussion groups. Um, my kids already spend too much time on the screen, so therefore I'm not going to use a device for therapy. I'm about to lose my mind when I read things like this. When there is no comparison to having a profession that is highly trained in improving language and communication, having a tool that is highly motivating, it's almost like you can explore language development with like this candy that doesn't make you fatter. You know, this iPad is this gold mine to me, right? I'm, my daughter is two years old and she's still nonverbal. We do lots of activities and there's nothing she enjoys. She actually spend more time than on when we're actually sitting on the floor. We get an iPad and we are practicing, you know, just simple following directions, simple vocabulary activities with me directing her, providing modeling. Um, and it could be like a 15 minute session, whatever, however long she's attending to that test. But I'm a professional who happens to be a parent, right? When you think of the average parent that we're giving this information, technology is bad, don't let it. You're bound to have this child on these moments of nothing because parents are busy with other things. Parents aren't available 24 hours a day. No, I'm not advocating sit a child in the front of the chair and give the iPad. No, don't want to be misinterpreted here. It's just about us making sure we're meeting real life expectations Right. And the difference between 
the expectations we put on a parent on how they handle technology and also our own expectations when you think of it because I think this is too different. It's very important to separate what we're expecting from the parent and what we're expecting from professionals that do have a very important training and have the training to elicit language with pieces of paper. And here you're giving this device and you're basically turning extreme motivation away out of the fear of an extra 15 minutes a week, 20 minutes a week, they actually get to see that kid or 30 minutes a week. You know, if you think of the big scheme all the time of a week of a frame of that child, you could have a highly motivational tool that you'd be using for 30 minutes in a week span of that child's life. I, and you opting to turn it away. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it, to me, it always goes back to that, you know, the perfect is the enemy of good thing, right? The, yeah, there, uh, sure, absolutely, we can all always be better parents or whatever, but, you know, priority number one sometimes you need to be, you know, <laughs> making sure that you have a little bit, like, you need that 15 minutes to yourself, right? It, it's funny to see the arguments in different disciplines, too. My, you know, my wife, um, I, we met in a master's for linguistics program, and she teaches adults uh, ESL, um, you know, English as a second language, and one of the pieces that, of advice that's given is to watch American television, to learn more English. And I'm not saying that we should put babies in front of the TV, but it is funny how, how people have different schools of thought. And um, a lot of that seems to be around, um, around tablets. But I've been giving some presentations lately on um, how I believe we have been failing these parents by also not providing a model of what these parents would be doing at home. So the parent has access to this technology. We could model to them how to appropriately use it at home because we're with them, with these kids, 30 minutes a week. But the parent is with that child a lot more than that. But if we take that opportunity to model the appropriate uses of this technology, I mean, you can imagine the, you know, the parents don't have to go to super duper and go buy products. They already own that device. Even if it's just their phone, they have access. We just need to show them because it feels intuitive to us. It does not feel intuitive to somebody that has to Google how to teach my, my kids to speak. It, it just doesn't. Um, and we right. forget this. Uh, modeling appropriate technology usage, that uh, prompting language. And you will see that this will eventually generalize as you're modeling with the technology. Next thing you know, they, you're modeling also appropriate language elicitation to a parent on an everyday basis. And I really believe that we should be, you know, the, there's the co-viewing part, there's the modeling to parents part that I feel like we don't do it enough. We just say, no, it's bad and let's find something else when sometimes it's just not the reality of an average parent. Yeah. Those of you listening, if you go to our YouTube, which is under Speech Science, or if you have a, an Amazon TV or a Roku, we have the Speech Science app on there. There's a, a video of me sitting there for half an hour just modeling with a student on AAC watching TV. And that's one of our least viewed videos. I can't imagine why. I, I Maybe <laughs> I can make that one a little bit more interesting. But I know, uh, Rachel, also there's a video on there of you doing a shared reading exercise with some modeling. Yeah, it's actually with animated shorts. So I love using... Um, you know, wordless videos. Um, That's great. Or, I don't know, otherwise known as uh, animated shorts. And it's such a great tool to model language that clinicians can very easily use in their sessions. And kids are so motivated. When mm -hmm. you pull out a really fun, you know, animated video and you can, that's the therapy. Um, and you can teach about how we can talk about it and we can talk about emotions. And I mean, it's just, it's fantastic. You know, I completely agree with you, Barbara. It's just like kind of very polarizing subject where people are on one extreme or the other. And you really need to find common ground and teach parents, just kind of increase awareness and teach parents how to interact with, you know, a tablet or an iPad um, and how to utilize right. these apps. Um, I use them in my practice all the time. Say I'm targeting WH questions and I have a specific app that I used in my session. Having the parents download that app and do the same thing that I did is such a great way to, you know, practice that carryover and, you know, hopefully achieve that generalization piece. So it's just, you can utilize technology in ways that are just so incredibly helpful to bridge the gap between mm -hmm. home and school and, you know, your session and, you know, they get data yeah. on what's happening at home. And you know, I mean, there's a million. Exactly. Hey, I noticed there's even a WH question app on, on smart ears. Do you, well, one question I have, and I, and I don't mean to transition abruptly if there's more to say here, but do you have favorites among your children here? Like, <laughs> you know, I do. Um, back in the day, it was probably, this is probably my third app and it used to be called the Sony articulation phonology assessment. Today's your articulation assessment toolkit. 
uh, but it's the same app because Apple switched the way we, the number of characters we have to have on the app. I had to reduce, shrink my app name, so we decided to switch the name. But back, it's probably Apple's release maybe in 2012, um, 2011, maybe 2010, and it's an assessment for articulation of phonology. I remember thinking that was when I was transitioning out of uh, public schools. I was primarily the evaluator for the school district. That was, I spent a whole year just doing evaluations for bilingual students here in, in the Irving district in the Dallas area. And so, you know, I was in this process of assessing articulation, assessing language, coming back home, finding a manual, scoring, writing a report. And I'm like, okay, let's make something easier here. And so initially the app um, that screens and assesses articulation is a very qualitative tool for assessing articulation and phonology. People are able to have a transcription at the top, they tackle that sound, they select a phonological process or substitution, and ultimately generates a report at the end. You know, that particular app, when I used to present, I used to present on that, people would get up and clap right? Because it just makes the life so much easier of, as an evaluator, being able, instead of writing the transcription, just actually having the transcription there for you, you tap on it to mark the error, the reports are generated automatically. There is an R screen, or it goes with a screen of the different types of R, sentence level, lots of different things built in that ultimately uh, everything is scored to get that qualitative information that will take you hours to generate on your own if you had to do it yourself. Then a couple of years after that, I partnered with a company here in Texas called Bilinguistics, and we created an app called BAPA, which is the Bilingual Articulation Phonology Assessment, which initially was designed just to be a Spanish version of Articulation Assessment Toolkit. But best practice tells us that we need to assess kids in both languages if they are bilingual, so it became a true bilingual assessment. It was standardized by Bilinguistics. Uh, and today is a fully standardized, it was the first fully standardized assessment tool for articulation phonology on the iPad. We standardized on the iPad. And if you have a bilingual student, you first assess, you know, one language, then you assess the other. The app compares how they're performing both languages. Uh, shows, let's say, initial B in Spanish. It was correct or in Spanish too. So it's comparing both sounds in both languages, how they are performing. So it gives the SLP uh, an easier way to actually even differentiate if it's a true disorder, if it's just a difference. And so I think that and probably custom boards, um, which allows people to create visual support on the go, those are kind of my top two babies yeah, that I have. Custom boards I've had for a while. I, I know that one for sure. So I really want to talk about your symbol sets, Smarty Symbols, because, right. you know, we obviously have a huge AAC audience and, uh, you know, I love, I love your symbols. I just love the way they look. So the, the materials that I create, I just think it looks really great. Um, so I just want you to, to talk a little bit about, you know, Smarty Symbols and, you know, who your biggest audience is, who's using Smarty Symbols, um, and just kind of how it all came to fruition. You know, for me, being a speech pathologist, I didn't go into a major business or anything related to that. But now today, I find myself into these various business ventures. And it's just really been putting one step after the other, one thing leading to the other, one opportunity finding another. And this is what had happened with Smarty Symbols. Um, Smarty Ears created an app called uh, Expressive, and it's a communication, it's a mid-level communication app. Uh, and then we also created custom boards. I did not want to license existing symbol sets that were on the market. I want to create my own symbol set. And initially I'm thinking, you know, I'm just gonna have 500,000 images just for my two apps and that would be it. Um, as time went by, you know, 2,000 images and we're making 3,000 and 5,000. Then we reach 11,000 images and people start messaging like, uh, Hey, the old struggle from Speak for Yourself, Barbara, we want to use these images on our app we're making. Can we license it? Okay, we'll license it to you. Then other people start asking, and I said, you know what? Uh, I think this is a separate business. The symbol set creation is not my app making business. So Smart that's how Smart Symbols was born in 2014 is really we, you know, Smart Symbols kind of broke into, became twin siblings. It's a completely separate entity. And the goal here is focusing on that symbol development. And today we have 23,000 symbols. Another thing that I 
that I noticed as we were in the process of making images is at the time, everybody was making the standard young Caucasian male character for every symbol set you see out there. And I'm like, okay, this is, I, I don't, I think we need diversity on symbol set here. You know, we introduced the, the concept of actually characters that people could pick their character. They could have a female character. They would have an African-American character. We have an elderly character. And we hope to expand these characters to give users options. You know, what I envision this in the future is where if you open an AAC app, and you happen to be African-American, you want to use an African-American character to represent the action words or the pronouns or anything else that has a character on it, you can pick that character. If you're a female user, you can pick a female character to represent that symbols. And it's really interesting because it was such a shift to me that when I was um, uh, talking to some advisors, people back from uh, my time in Philadelphia, from Pennsylvania, from Temple, the idea that that original character that's used was not Caucasian or male, it was no race or no gender, but that's not really, if you look at it, there is a skin tone, there is features that you, you would imagine if you had to pick that is a young Caucasian male. And so I'm happy to see other symbol makers started introducing the idea of skin tone to their character set, they haven't gone as far as we have as completely different outfit, different clothing, hairstyle. They did end up introducing, and I'm kind of glad to see this kind of taking over the symbol makers out there. Um, and so Smart Assembly just kind of grew where we initially just wanted to offer it to um, educators, special ed teachers, AAC users, a way to access the symbols that we are creating. Um, but then it grew to um, being able uh, to offering them not only download the image, but they can actually create the material on the Smarty Symbols website with simple drag and drop tools, uh, customize and have an, an easy with a very limited learning curve to create a material for the classroom um, or whatever they wanted to use it for. That, that's great. We, we um, I, I mean, again, working in the AAC field, obviously, that's what we talk a lot about here, but that's my own personal work. You know, the the concept of creating simple sets and iconicity in these things is such a huge undertaking that it's just sort of, I to me, it only blows my mind that you just sort of were like, oh, whoops, we accidentally are making these anyway. And also, by the way, let's fix racial and gender expression at the same time, which uh, now even things like emojis. And this has been, I think, a little bit of a, a elephant in the room for a while in, the, in for us. LP. And Ashley knows how I feel about this, which is our licensing body. But, you know, we have 97% females as um, working as SLPs, 97% women, but something like 60% of Ashley fellows are men. And that seems a little yeah. bit of a, a, an odd distinction there to me. So over time, uh, I imagine that'll correct itself. And we do have um, some great representation and leadership right now, right now in this moment, Nasha. So, so, so I'm one of those people, and you know, I've talked about it on the show before. That's that's kind of on the the high end of ADHD, and, and one of the one of the characteristics of that is a starter of many things and finisher of few, right? And um, I, one thing I've been really impressed with is that you've started and finished a lot of things. One thing I think about a lot in our industry, and I've, I've sort of joked about this before, is starting a nonprofit that goes, you know, when when an SLP is retiring and helps them empty their office and just takes all their stuff and scans it because I'm convinced there's some brilliant lesson plan from 1976 in there that nobody's ever going to think of again. So what does somebody do when they do have that brilliant idea? Um, you know, or I, should, do they come to you? So ideas are something really abstract that happens all the time. We all have them. The real thing here is people acting and having taken the step towards implementing that idea. So there is that difference between I have an idea of an app that I wanna make for language versus I do have the time and commitment to write 2,000 questions, review 2,000 questions and, and act on. It's almost like I have an idea to write this book. I'm actually sitting and writing the book. It's two different things. I do believe that if you are in that journey of actually taking the step and committing to doing something, then yes, we can talk about that. Um, but the idea piece, we need to work on it. You know, I think that there's a lot of folks out there that have uh, that have great ideas, and you're absolutely right. There's a huge distinction between, and and I think people need to recognize the creating curriculum and um, 
you know, certainly creating apps is, is a lot of work. Um, uh, you know, and it can, it can be a lot of fun for five hours and then, uh, yeah. you know, and then a lot of tedious for, for 500. But, um, you know, I'll say from my experience, which is, I, you know, far more limited than, than your own in terms of what you created, um, it's, it's worth it. I mean, if, you, if you're able to really get that idea out there and then watch what happens um, in the world when a, the child's using it or a therapist, it's so rewarding. Well, you know, we, yeah. you think long term, uh, not just creating the app, but the app is going to, it has to exist for a certain amount of time. You know, being in this industry for so long, I see people come and go, probably 80% of the people that were with me back then, let's put it 95% of the people that started with me back then, they're no longer making apps or their apps might not even be available anymore because with iOS 11, Apple kicked those people out of the app store if they hadn't updated in the last two years. Um, right. And now it's now suddenly 64 bit is going to be a requirement. And yep. suddenly now it's going to be the OSX screen, right? In a few weeks. Yeah. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's always a new thing. So it's, it's a constant, you have to be able to keep on it and evolve all the time. So what do you think is on the horizon? Uh, and I, that could be for, for Sparta years or in general, like what's the next big thing for apps? You know, going back, I feel like I have been just taking one step after the other, right? It's, it's hard to predict. It, to me, it's always was hard to predict where I would be, you know, 14 years ago. I would never imagine I'd be here actually speaking English fluently or speaking any other language for that matter. When you were monolingual for 21 years, you never imagined that you'd be speaking a different language later on in life. Yeah, I think you just um, disproved the critical the uh, period hypothesis. And the same for, you know, if you even think of where my company was 10 years ago versus where it is today, or I never imagined that I would start another business. Um, and sometimes, you know, if I, if I was to give a general advice about, you know, some of the things that I have personally experienced is people imagine that I had this plan all along that ever since I was a little girl, I wanted to own a company called Smarty Ears, and these were going to be the steps it was going to take. And it holds them back from taking that next step. It's the building blocks that we do with our students. And sometimes if you are today, if you're feeling stuck as an SLP doing whatever it is that you were doing and you wish you'd be doing something else, just take that one step, even though you're not sure what's going to lead you. But if you always follow right. the passion, I think things end up, there's always fruition out of that. That's a perfect point. And that's, and you know what I use to organize those thoughts myself? Apps. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, if there's, a, I guess, any one message um, for, for SLPs out there listening, uh, you know, to convey about, about anything really, what would it be? Um, you know, I'm always, I love collaborating, not just SLPs outside of our field. You know, if it's not us making an app together, sometimes it could be, you know what, I um, enjoy doing podcasts. And I have a podcast and I'd love to have you on. Yeah, me too. This, is, this is ways that us human beings interact and grow together, right? You have your own thing. I have my own thing. We do our thing together and everybody benefits from it. So if you're listening and you're an engineer and you have this idea, let's connect. If you're an OT and whatever field you're in, um, I feel like people could always benefit from collaboration. I really believe in, in almost um, this ability to exchange knowledge, exchange information, and collaboration. So I'm, I'm really that one step after the other open for everything in the universe might throw at me person. So if you have any ideas, thoughts, messages, you feel to message me anytime. So it sounds like uh, absolutely, if, you, if you'd like to learn more about Barbara and her work, uh, check out Smarty Ears, Smarty Symbols, or Geek SLP, right? I think that's it. Yeah, you have, you have a, that sums up some yeah. of it. <laughs> there's, there's a piece of it. So I, 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 think, I think they'll be able to track you down. Of course, we also will have links and all that information in the show notes for this episode, which you can find at tech.speechscience.org. You also can contact us at tech at speechscience.org, um, and we'd be happy to pass along any, any questions um, ourselves. Uh, but once again, for Lucas Stuber, joined by Rachel Madel, and today with Barbara Hernandez, thanks so much for joining us. We will talk to you guys next week. Thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure being here. Well, thank you so much to Barbara Fernandez of Smart Ears for joining us. That was uh, an incredibly inspirational interview. I don't have any idea how she does as much as she does, but I hope she keeps it up because I think we all benefit from it. Um, 
Speaking of which, if you enjoy what we do here on the podcast, please do uh, subscribe um, on whatever your podcast app is of choice, whether that's iTunes or Google, whatever they call it now, or et cetera. Um, if you do find a podcast app, by the way, that we're not on, um, feel free to let us know and I'll, I'll make sure that we're on there. And if you haven't found us on Facebook, just search Talk Tech. Uh, join our group. We have a Facebook page and we have a group. The group is awesome. It's where all of our fun conversations happen. We talked a lot about private practice. If you're thinking about starting a private practice, post in our group, ask us questions. We would love to hear from you guys. Well, once again, for Talking With Tech, this has been Lucas Stuber, joined by Rachel Madel. Thanks, as always, to our awesome producer, Luke Padgett, uh, who's in the background guiding us all the way. Aw, uh, thank you, uh, <laughs> We will talk to you guys next week. <laughs>